What is up Chiefs Kingdom? Welcome back to another video on my channel. My name is Josh Fan of ShowMeFootball.com and ArrowheadAddict.com covering your Kansas City Chiefs. And I'm here to break down the Kansas City Chiefs 26-25 victory over the Cincinnati Bengals in week two of the NFL season. Folks, the Kansas City Chiefs defeated the Cincinnati Bengals on a buzzer-beating field goal from 51 yards out by Harrison Butker. And I need to start off by saying that this is a good win over a good team. Yes, the Bengals struggled in week one. Yes, they did not look particularly great today either. But the Bengals are a team that is a current rival of the Kansas City Chiefs. Rivalry games are always tough the same way that divisional games are always closer than they should be when you look at the two teams on paper. The Cincinnati Bengals are still an incredibly talented team with a really good quarterback at the helm, and they've given the Chiefs fits throughout the years. And to be 2-0 through the first two weeks of the season, uh, after facing two very good teams in the Baltimore Ravens and the Cincinnati Bengals, that's an accomplishment. I mean, this could have gone a lot worse for the Kansas City Chiefs, but right now they stand at 2-0, and and that's a very good thing uh, with this difficult stretch in the Chiefs' schedule to begin the season. I think it's good that the Kansas City Chiefs were able to win this game despite a not-so-great day from the offense and a not-so-great day from Patrick Mahomes. We had another very uncharacteristic game from Patrick Mahomes. However, it's still very early in the season, and as I said, the Cincinnati Bengals are a team that's given us fits. However, that mental block that remains with this team every time they play the Bengals is driving me a little crazy because there were a lot of times where Patrick Mahomes made a terrible throw and it's like, come on, man, you're better than that. You know, like you, you, you have to be better than that. You expect more out of your superstar quarterback. And then the other main issue is that the Chiefs really didn't get any production out of their pass catchers outside of Rasheed Rice. Travis Kelsey didn't do much. Xavier Worthy didn't do anything. And we still need to give those guys the benefit of the doubt for right now. I'm not saying any of this to freak people out, or, or I'm not saying that it's going to be a long-term issue, a long-term concern, but it could become one because we all know that Hollywood Brown is probably now out for the entire season. And he was a big free agent veteran addition to this wide receiver room that was supposed to be a target that Patrick Mahomes could go to consistently. He was supposed to be a reliable target, and now he's not there. And this is kind of what I was afraid of, where Rasheed Rice is really the only guy. Like, he's the only guy in the wide receiver room that can be relied upon. And even Rasheed Rice couldn't be relied upon um, until the latter half of the 2023 NFL season. But this is kind of one of those things that I'm going to be watching going forward now after this game is, can this team consistently get production out of its pass catchers outside of Rasheed Rice. Travis Kelsey was quiet, and I, I think Travis Kelsey will come along eventually, but here's the thing. We were trying to avoid this again. We were trying to avoid a situation in which Travis Kelsey needed to have a great game in order for the Chiefs offense to succeed, and we're kind of starting to lean on him again. He's 34 years old, and I just think that's unfair to him. That's why you brought in Xavier Worthy and Hollywood Brown. Now you're down Hollywood Brown. And then that is a good transition into my next point is that Isaiah Pacheco, after this game, Mike Florio of Pro Football Talk uh, said right before Sunday Night Football that the concern for Isaiah Pacheco is a potential fibula, an injury to the fibula bone in his leg. And there's a clip going around social media right now where you can see Isaiah Pacheco get bent back on that play that he got injured. And all I'll say for right now is it didn't look good. And that I'd be very surprised if Pacheco didn't at least go on IR. Uh, that's just kind of how the injury looked. And he left the stadium with crutches and in a walking boot. So here's the thing. This team, the reason a lot of us were so excited about them is because they returned a lot of the defense from last year that carried them to a Super Bowl victory. And we saw the improvements that Brett Veach and the front office made to the offense. And we said, you know, now this team has the opportunity. I mean, they have such a good chance to three-peat because they brought back so much of that great defense from last year. And now you finally have a formidable offense. But not even two weeks into the season... We may lose Isaiah Pacheco for a very long time, and Hollywood Brown is out for the season. Losing your big free agent addition to the wide receiver room and your starting running back isn't a great recipe to three-peat. 
And again, I'm not trying to freak people out or say that the season's done or anything like that. I'm not saying that at all. And I still think there's promising players on this offense that we'll see progress throughout the year. But I just think there needs to be more of a floor put in place because last year we thought, ah, some of these guys will take a step forward. They'll get better. And they never got better. And the floor bottomed out. And so if I'm Brett Veach, I'm thinking... Maybe you have to go and sign a veteran or a veteran free agent running back, or maybe you have to make a trade for a wide receiver at the deadline because the offense was supposed to be better this year. And I still think it will be. Uh, I, it'll be really hard for them to be worse than last year. But, you know, two weeks through the season, losing your starting running back and your number one wide receiver, it's just not good, guys. I mean, you have to create more depth. And look, I'm going to continue pounding the table and saying this. I don't understand why we pass up on J.K. Dobbins. And a lot of people are probably thinking, oh, Josh, why are you going on about this again? The whole J.K. Dobbins thing. We had him in the building this offseason, guys. He wanted to sign here. The Chargers got him for dirt cheap. Through two, we- And here's the thing. When we passed on J.K. Dobbins, not even 24 hours later, we signed CEH. We essentially chose CEH over J.K. Dobbins. Two weeks through the NFL season, CEH is yet to play a game, and J.K. Dobbins leads the NFL in rushing. J.K. Dobbins has been tearing it up for the Los Angeles Chargers. And that's one that I'll never get over is this is exactly what I was afraid of. This is what me and Michael Darcy were saying all offseason. You're an Isaiah Pacheco injury away from this being the worst running back room in the NFL. And look, I, I'm, I like Carson Steele. I'm excited for him. I want to see what he can do. I like the addition for or of Samaj P. Ryan, but uh, without Pacheco, this is still probably the worst running back room in the NFL. I can't think of too many that are worse than that. And I just think, you know, you see CEH sitting on the shelf and I get that the Chiefs are doing right by him and all that, but man, this is a business and you have to make the team better. And signing CEH and letting J.K. Dobbins go to the Chargers did not make this team better. And that's just one that I'll never get over. And uh, the Isaiah Pacheco injury just sheds more light on that decision. Going back to the Bengals game, though, I said all of last year that the magic number was 24 or 25 points, more often than not, probably 25, uh, to win games. And the offense had 26 points today, and they won. And so as, as, as long as this Chiefs team continues to hit that number offensively, the defense is going to give them a great opportunity to win most of their games. And the defense hasn't even been perfect through, through these first couple games. And I do have some thoughts on the defense. You know, they weren't perfect today. One issue that seems to be a constant now through two games is that uh, the Chiefs cannot cover tight ends. And it's beginning to be a problem. And a lot of it is Nick Bolton. And I'm a Mizzou fan. I love Nick Bolton. I'm a Nick Bolton defender. But he's been a lot of the problem. He is getting killed in coverage. But a lot of this is on the coaching staff too. You know, similar to 2021 a few years ago uh, when we still had Dan Sorensen on the team. And it was Sorensen's last season with the Kansas City Chiefs. It got to a point where it's like, okay, we know Sorensen is bad. But why does the coaching staff continue to put him in a position to fail? You know, Nick Bolton probably shouldn't be out there on third downs. Yet He's on there on those third and long passing plays. And that just can't continue to happen. It's not his spot. It's It shouldn't be his responsibility. And that's where I start to look at the coaching staff and say, look, this is a decision you have to stop making. Nick Bolton can't be out there in coverage all the time. And the Willie, the loss of Willie Gay, you know, that's where it's kind of starting to show up a little bit because Willie Gay did have some of those coverage responsibilities. He's a lot better than Bolton in coverage. And, you know, Willie Gay never really reached his ceiling here, I thought, but he was still a hell of a lot better than Bolton in coverage. That was one of his strengths. Bolton needs to be more of that mental processor in the middle of the defense who can play downhill, come in on rundowns. That's, that's what he is. And uh, I think the Chiefs are trying to make him a little bit more than that. And that's a concern. Um, I also think that the pass rush now is something that we can start talking about. Uh, Chris Jones needs help. I I just, I don't see the edges winning enough of their blocks. And that's what allowed the Bengals to get a lot of big chunk plays today. And it's just something that has to get better. And, And sometimes the Chiefs pass rush has started out slow before, and then it starts to kind of heat up as the season goes on. And we are going to get Charles Amenihu back at some point, but it's still going to be a little while. And I would maybe be looking 
to bring in additional defensive end depth too. We're seeing what Cam Jones has because we haven't quite seen him yet. But I mean, Felix Inudike, Ozama, Mike Dana, George Karloftis, they're not doing enough right now. And we're back to a position where Chris Jones is being asked to do everything. And that's unfair to him. It's unfair to Chris Jones the same way as it is to Travis Kelsey. Some people kind of weren't a huge fan of paying Chris Jones all that money, a five-year deal especially at his age. And it's like, well, if you want Chris Jones to age well, you should be out here with me saying the Kansas City Chiefs need to bring in more help in the pass rush department. Chris Jones can't do it all himself. And as he gets older and starts to get towards the end of that contract, you want to give him more help. So pass rush wasn't great. An area of the defense I was impressed by, though, was the secondary. I thought the secondary had... A pretty good game once again. I, I don't think they were too glaring. Um, Trent McDuffie pretty much shut Jamar Chase down. Jamar Chase only had four catches for 35 yards. I mean, you'll take holding Jamar Chase under 50 yards any single day of the week. All in all, I think the defense is doing enough right now. Yes, I have some complaints here and there. Yes, you have to be able to cover tight ends better. The pass rush needs to get a little bit better. At least there's help coming in the horizon though for the pass rush you know that that Charles Amenhu edition is going to be coming at the midway point of the season so I can at least hold out until then before I'm super harsh about the pass rush <clears throat> although I'd like to see more M- most of my complaints from this game have to be about the offense I mean even Patrick Mahomes said it after the game that uh, they didn't play a great game offensively but another issue and it's a big one is left tackle. Kingsley Suamataia was probably the worst performer today out of anyone on the team. It was the second game. He looked okay against the Ravens. Not great. And then today he just looked bad. But this is why I've never been a fan of starting a rookie left tackle. The, these are just kind of the results you get whenever you start a rookie left tackle. Unless it's like a top 10 guy in the draft, this is usually what happens. The rookie left tackle is going to struggle. And I was always kind of skeptical of the idea that a rookie was just going to come in here and play good enough for you to win a Super Bowl. That is a position where if you cannot get a guy good enough, it makes it extremely tough to win a Super Bowl. And right now, the left tackle play that the Kansas City Chiefs are getting from Kingsley Suomataia is not good enough to win a Super Bowl. Of course, that doesn't mean that it can't be, you know, by the time that the Chiefs reach the playoffs. It's not to say that he can't get better, but today was unacceptable. But I just also think that's the results you get when You put a rookie against a guy that had 17 and a half sacks last year. Trey Hendrickson is really good. And that's just kind of the result you're going to get. But yeah, Kingsley got whooped up on today, guys. And they didn't really give him much chip help. That was something that I was a little bit disappointed in the coaching staff for. I think eventually on that last drive, though, they put in Wanya Morris. But even Wanya Morris wasn't much better. And then he got an illegal hands to the face penalty that... Uh, took away the Rasheed Rice catch on fourth down that would have given them a first and made things a little bit more difficult, a little bit more interesting. And then, of course, the game came down to the penalty, which we'll talk about in a second. But a little bit more on the left tackle situation. If I were the Chiefs, I'd have Donovan Smith on the phone tomorrow because I just can't, I I don't think you can do this because then you risk Pat's health too. And that's a big thing. It's not that Kingsley can't get better and that he won't get better with more snaps, but we're talking about Patrick Mahomes' health being at risk. And then at that point, we have zero chance at a Super Bowl. So yes, if I were the Chiefs, I would bring in a veteran tackle such as Donovan Smith, who played decent football for you in 2023, not that long ago. And of course, it'd take him a little bit to get up to shape and you'd have to get him into practice and stuff. But I mean, he's been sitting at home getting his body right. So if I were the Chiefs, I'd heavily consider it. And I tweeted this out after the game on my Show Me Football Twitter account. And it's great to be 2-0, as I said at the beginning of the video, but there's three long-term concerns that I have for the Chiefs, and that's wide receiver, defensive end, and offensive tackle. And you could probably throw a running back in there now with the Pacheco injury. Because uh, at the time I tweeted that, I wasn't sure how severe it was. But those are the three long-term concerns. And what really irks me is that we could have said that for the past five years. Like, it's always those same three positions that continue to be an issue for the Chiefs. No matter who they seem to bring in, no matter what moves are made in the offseason, no matter what the coaches say, the top three needs on this team seem to be 
wide receiver, offensive tackle, and defensive end. And I just wonder how many more assets do we have to throw at these positions before we just get it right? Um, and one more time, I, I'll reiterate. I'm not saying that Kingsley Suomataia isn't it and that he's a bust and that he won't work out. I'm not saying that the Kansas City Chiefs wide receivers are going to be like this all year. Maybe they bring someone in. You know, none of this is final. None of this is written in stone. But those are long-term concerns that I have that I'm going to I'm going to reserve judgment and yeah, this is something that I said over the offseason, but after watching the Chiefs win a Super Bowl after how bad the offense was, you know, last year, after watching them win a Super Bowl and 2019 no matter how bad that defense was after watching them win a Super Bowl after getting into dogfights with the Broncos and Texans at the end of the regular season you know the Chiefs have earned the benefit of the doubt so I'm not here to freak out Uh, the Chiefs had the benefit of the doubt for me that they're going to figure things out and clean up a lot of these mistakes that they're making but I have to call it how I see it and these are things that I'm going to be watching going forward but Ultimately, 2-0 after playing two very good teams. You can't ask for much more than that. Last thing before I sign off, the penalty at the end of the game, the pass interference that was called on the Cincinnati Bengals. Of course, it's drawing a bunch of controversy again because the Chiefs always seem to end the game on a controversial call from the referees. But once again, I think this conversation is getting to a ridiculous point where, okay, it was pass interference. Like, if you watch it, it was pass interference. The defensive back played through the back of Rasheed Rice and got to him before the ball arrived. By definition, it was pass interference. But people are complaining about when the call is being made. And like, I even saw a tweet from Jeff Schwartz saying, I understand why you don't want it called in that situation. It's like, well, well, hold on a second. So you're saying that it shouldn't be called because of the time in the game? Like, again, this conversation has gotten to a ridiculous point where people are convincing themselves that because the fact that the game is on the line, we shouldn't call penalties even though they're being committed. Like, this makes zero sense, guys. Come on, it was a penalty. It it was. It was a pass interference, and that's why the refs called it. I understand your frustration that it was called at the end of the game, and I understand people's frustrations that the refs don't seem to call pass interferences all the time when they do occur. But the fact of the matter is it was a pass interference. And... How come no one's talking about the fact that the Kansas City Chiefs did convert the fourth down the play prior, but then the Bengals were bailed out by a hands-to-the-face call that could have easily been missed, could have easily gone either way. That's why this conversation is just ridiculous to me. I don't really care that much when you're this successful. People are going to find things to hate on your team for. They're going to find excuses, and that's just what it is. So, yeah, those are my thoughts on the Kansas City Chiefs defeating the Cincinnati Bengals 26-25. Let me know what your guys' thoughts are down in the comments. What did you think of this game? Do you agree with me? Disagree with me on anything? Do you guys have any long-term concerns coming out of this game? Would love to hear from y'all. With all that being said, make sure you like, share, and subscribe so more Kansas City Chiefs fans can find this. And make sure you check out my work on showmefootball.com and arrowheadaddict.com for more. I'll see you all in the next one. Go Chiefs!